I'm Cindy Kelly, and I'm interviewing here Dima Chavez. And my first question to him is, please tell us your name and how to spell it. Dimas, D-I-M-A-S, Chavez, C-H-A-V-E-Z. I uh, was born in the central part of New Mexico, a small little ranching, farming, uh, Mexican-American community by the name of Torreon, which is eh, not too far from Albuquerque. Uh, my father was one of 12, and he and his brothers and sisters, mainly his brothers, they helped my grandfather run three ranches, of which they had a lot of sheep, about 4,000 head of sheep. Uh, and it was just a small, simple little community. Uh, I grew up only with the Spanish language. Uh, we all spoke just Spanish there at home. And uh, it was just a, a wonderful period of time as a child until December 7th of 1941 when uh, our entire world was basically kind of turned up, upside down. What happened uh, with the bombing of Pearl Harbor is that it drained our community of all the young men and uh, a lot of the farms and crops and animals suffered as a result of them having to go off to war. Uh, our family on both sides. My mother was a Chavez before she married, and uh, of course my father a Chavez, so I was pure, pure Chavez. Um, I had an uncle, two uncles on my father's side, Jose and Natividad. Uh, uncle Tive went to Japan. Uncle Jose went to Germany. He got uh, wounded quite bad, he was sent home with Purple Heart. And my uncle Feliciano Chavez, my mother's older brother, uh, went uh, to North Africa and fought as a foot soldier with General Patton. Uh, but during this period of time, uh, my father and his older brother, my Tio Carlos, uh, they were given a deferma so to run the ranches and, and so forth, and the drought then hit, and it was just a chaotic period of time. Uh, a lot of the families moved to eastern LA. The majority went to Albuquerque, uh, the Atchison, and the Pekin and Santa Fe had what they call a roundhouse, where they overhauled locomotives and so forth. So a lot of uh, a lot of the men sought employment there. My father got a job at the Bronze Hospital in Santa Fe. They were just at the time building it, uh, and he drifted back and forth with that job. He was also a truck driver. He drew he drove trucks to Arizona. And there were times that we wouldn't see him, only on weekends. Uh, we moved to Santa Fe at a very small, simple, one-room apartment, no bigger than this office, in fact, smaller. Uh, and it was on Buena Vista. It was right off of Old Pecos Highway. And I still remember the lady who ran the place, Mrs. Gomez. And it was a unique little place there uh, because it, uh, it, it took in individuals who just didn't have a lot of income, which was my father and others. Um, and we had communal bath, uh, of which we took a bath once a week. Uh, I started kindergarten at a school nearby, and still to this day I remember my uh, kindergarten teacher's name as Nickel Sam. Now, keeping in mind, uh, Cindy, I'm still only fluent in Spanish. So I started my first few days of kindergarten there, and I remember I had to go to the restroom, very bad one day. And I noticed that the children would raise their hand, and the teacher, Mrs. Nicholson, would acknowledge, and they would stand up and say something, and then I would see that they would walk out the door in the direction of where the bathroom was. Well, Irene Sanchez, a cousin of mine, who had about as much ability in English language as I did, um, I poked her and I said, Irene, I need to go to the bathroom. How do you say it in English? She says, I have no idea. Well, it became pretty dangerous for me. So I raised my hand, and this caught everybody by surprise. The quiet one is going to speak, including the teacher. Now, at this point, I want to fast forward to the old Johnny Carson show. And one evening, he had an all-Mexican uh, cast or whatever. He had Ricardo Montalban, Anthony Quinn, Vicky Carr, the singer, uh, others. And I remember Johnny Carson asking uh, Ricardo Montalban, who had come from Mexico, what it was like for him to earn 
learn English as a second language. And his response was that it sounded at times like a pack of dogs barking. So I, could, I stood up and I opened my mouth and I just started moving my mouth and saying words that I had no understanding idea what I was saying. And I may have sounded like a pack of dogs, I don't know. But uh, everybody started laughing. I quietly sat in my seat and had to relieve myself. Uh, at about that time we had uh, a recess and I kind of hugged the walls until everybody spotted the wet spot and they all started taunting me and what have you. And I ran home as fast as I could, just in tears and, and searched for uh, my mother. <laughs> and I, as always, she just soothed me down, quieted me down, and she says, we're, we're going to work on this. We're, we're going to get over this. At about this time, Dad came home with a big surprise, and he says, guess what? I've been offered a job. Uh, don't know what I'm doing. Don't know exactly where it's at, but it's called Los Alamos. And I have to go to a place called uh, 109 East Palace to meet with a lady there, and then she will give me further instructions. Well, Mom and I are just so excited about this. And of course, up to then, I've only known outhouses and <laughs> no electricity. We, we had no indoor plumbing. In fact, uh, a real quick sidebar, Cindy, if I may, when I was just a little boy, my Uncle Feliciano, who, as I mentioned earlier, well, went to World War II, uh, he took me one day, I was just a little kid, to Mountain Air, which is about 15 miles or so from Torreon, to treat me to my first restaurant. And I was so excited. And when we got there, I told my uncle I had to go to the bathroom. So he took me by the hand and he led me back to the bathroom. I had never been in a bathroom because like I say, all we had was outdoor toilets. And he showed me the mechanism of flushing, which just absolutely amazed me. I couldn't get over it. <laughs> So after a while, my uncle got a little worried. You know, I says, well, where's Demas? So he comes in there and he found me squatted on the floor, just flushing and reflushing because I couldn't get over where all the stuff was going and so forth. But anyway, back again to moving or, or being in, in Santa Fe. Uh, Dad mentioned that uh, it looks like we we're going to be moving up there. He didn't know exactly what he was going to be doing. Uh, and there was some secrecy involved. Well, I had no idea what he was talking about. And <clears throat> I was just excited over the fact that we were going to leave that one room house. Now, keep in mind, we had a bed in this house. And in that bed, my mother, my father, my sister, and I slept on that bed, the four of us. Now, I'm the oldest of five. The second born was my, daughter, my sister Dolores, who passed away in 1966, and she was born with Down syndrome. The third born, uh, Trinidad, uh, he only lived for about 16 months. Uh, he developed some problems with uh, uh, dysentery, fever, and so forth, and he passed away. We didn't have very good medical services out in the, in the ranch. Uh, and then, uh, Lenora, my sister, was born in uh, 1943 in Albuquerque in July, uh, yeah, in July of 1947, the 31st to be specific. So she was just a, a little girl, or a baby, while we're living at uh, this one room place in Buena Vista. So when Dad got the green light, uh, he says, okay, we're leaving. And we packed up his 39 Chevy Coupe, Mom and Pop and Dolores and I and uh, my sister Lenora in my mother's arms. <clears throat> and we began this trip, uh, which I'll never forget. It was an old dirt road. Uh, it was somewhat passable up until the time you got up to Rampawake. But then from there, there was an old dirt road that wove through uh, El Rancho and some San Lefonso Pueblo and it was just an old dusty dirt road. Then we approached the old Ottawa wooden bridge and he crossed there and then it got treacherous as the road started snaking up the side of the mountains and sheer drops on both sides, no guardrails of any sort. 
huge, uh, heavy uh, earth moving equipment all around us, uh, just a lot of activity constantly. And the first stop was the uh, military police post, and there, that had to present reams and reams of documentation. Well, I held on tightly to my sister Dolores, mom with Lenora, and, and dad began to interact. And I was absolutely amazed at the command that, uh, of the English language that dad had picked up. It wasn't the best, but nevertheless it was passable, and mom as well. And so a lot of questions were asked, and then they began just tearing the, the car apart. They were removing the seats, looking in the trunk, under the hood, and I would ask mom in Spanish, well, what were they doing? She says, ah, they're looking for something. And I says, well, why don't they tell you what they're looking for? We can tell them where it's at, you know, or something like that. Anyway, the, the inspection was finally completed, and I noted the same thing happening with the vehicles that were departing the hill, or Los Alamos. And the other shocking thing right after that was as dad was given the green light, he says, okay, Mr. Chavez, you have X minutes from this point to another checkpoint where you'll be stopped. And if you don't make it there in that prescribed period of time, the MPs will come after you. Now, well, this just scared me to death. I had no idea what in, what in the world are we moving, we moving into. So sure enough, we came to this checkpoint and they checked the pump off, and then he goes to the next one, and then we eventually arrived at a log cabin that had been assigned to us, an original log cabin from the old boys' ranch. It was, as I understand, belonged to the caretaker there. It was just a simple two-room log cabin, very small. But we had running water, hot and cold water, and a flushing toilet, I'll never forget that. Uh, two entries, one that uh, was on the front side and one on the back side by the kitchen. And we were just right on the shadows of the old wooden water tower uh, that was there for the boys' ranch. Uh, everybody was tuned in to uh, a radio station at the time. Uh, Robert Porton was there with the Army, and he had a, a radio station, call letters KRS. And uh, everyone was just tuned in constantly just to see how the war was going. Uh, interesting features of what may be happening in Los Alamos, etc. But the most important thing was whenever we had shortage of water, uh, Mr. Porton would announce it. So that gave us a heads up, particularly mom, and when we'd come in with buckets and pails and what have you and fill it up with as much water as we possibly could because the water was gonna be shut off or there would be no water. And from there, uh, Zia Company, uh, which is sort of the unspoken hero in my estimate uh, of Los Alamos, <clears throat> they, they, they provided a lot in the development of the atomic bomb, a, a tremendous amount of effort, uh, my father uh, specifically, uh, but many others. But what they would do is they would drive down to the Rio Grande and they would fill up these trucks full, uh, with, that had these huge water containers and they went through some purification process and they would drive it back up and pump it into the, 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 the water tower, the, the wooden water tower. Now, what was really neat is not far from us was Bathtub Row, where all the biggies, Oppenheimers, etc., lived. And they, they only lived 50, 75 yards from where our house was. But Dad had a friend that worked with him at Zia Company by the name of Joe Tapia and his... Uh, daughter, Mary, eventually went to school with me. And Joe would come by mom's house first before he started pumping water into the tank and he'd give mom <laughs> as much water as possible before they actually, you know, dispersed the rest of it to where it was actually needed. Well, we moved to Los Alamos in August of 1943. Uh, and my command of the English language it was zero. The much-awaited schooling year was about to begin, and they were constructing Central School, the only school in Los Alamos. It went from the first through the twelfth grade. And it had an enrollment in 1943 of 112 students. And I began the first grade there. My first grade teacher was Ms. Ruth Quinlan, and, and she had a son by the name of Eddie Wartman, 
who was there with the service, and he also later went, not also, but later became an employee of the laboratory as a purchasing agent. My father walked me to school, and he informed her. He said, uh, my son doesn't have too much knowledge of the English language, but I wanted you to know, but he's willing to learn. So I got introduced into the famous weekly reader with Dick, Jane, Spot, and the bouncing red ball. And I found myself in trouble because as the rest of the class was reading and proceeding, I would translate as much as I could into Spanish and then back into English, and I found myself falling way behind. Plus the fact, when you're in school with uh, these super students of eminent scientists and so forth uh, who set the bar, uh, I, I was intimidated, tremendously intimidated. Uh, and I would tell my mother, I, she, I could tell, tell her anything, and we just had a beautiful relationship. And <clears throat> she realized how this was affecting me. Well, my mother was a marvelous cook. A lot of the scientists' wives were basically bored to death, those who weren't part of the project, and they would just walk around. But they would walk by our house and they would smell these lovely odors coming out of her kitchen. And unknown to me at the time, they knocked on her door one day and wanted to know why, what is this lovely smell and so forth and so on. And mother in her way explained. And she said, we'd sure like to know how to cook some of that stuff. And my mother says, well, let's make a deal. Now my mother has a sixth grade education. My father had an eighth grade education. She cut a deal with some of these ladies, uh, Stanislaw's wife, uh, Mrs. Bradbury, Lois Bradbury, that I remember. And the deal was mother would share with them how to prepare a variety of Mexican dishes in exchange for tutoring me after school. So I would come home after school, mom said, you'd be sure to come home right away. And then they would kind of walk me through. And Mrs. Quinlan, she would work extremely hard to get me to present myself, uh, uh, gain assurance, confidence, and so forth. And this went on for a few years, and the more we did it, the, the more comfortable I, I began. Now, right next to the log cabin where we lived, there was a lovely aroma that we would meet us in the morning, at the very early morning. George Hillhouse, whose wife, Dorothy Hillhouse, was a school teacher, in fact, became my second grade teacher, was our baker. He opened the first bakery in Los Alamos, and it was located in an old wooden building there that I, I think some individuals indicated that it served as a carport or various other things, but he somehow managed to me, uh, change things around to make it a presentable place where he could do some, some baking. And people would just come in there, pick up their bread, and what have you in the morning. But the gold mine for us kids was at the corner of this building. And there was a gentleman by the name of Mr. Moore who, who ran Moore's Stationery. And there was this prize item for a penny that you could buy. It was called Fleer's Bubblegum. And we would all lined up for school with our few pennies in our hand in hopes that they wouldn't run out and we'd get our little supply of bubble gum, exchange the little cartoons that, that came with them and so forth. Growing up in Los Alamos was really unique. It was special. Uh, we didn't have fancy uh, playgrounds or anything of that nature. And we had a lot of <clears throat> imagination. The first real friend who to this day remains uh, a very dear friend, it's George Brooks. Uh, George's father worked for Zia as well. And um, George and I sort of hit it off pretty good. And I think what attracted me to him so much, and vice versa, is that George had an older sister, Virginia, who graduated in one of the first classes out of school there, but his, the, his other sister, Glenda, uh, was born with cerebral palsy, and she, she walked with a brace in her leg, and her arm was uh, uh, not at 100% use, and, and when she spoke, she slurred her words, but just a beautiful woman. And his mother was Mexican, so 
George's mother and my mother used to converse and chitty chat quite a bit. And I think that that's really what drew George and I together, <coughs> uh, as, as, as it did back then. Uh, George, uh, Glenda continued schooling with us. Uh, and as I mentioned, I started the first grade in Los Alamos. And uh, the first grade was, at first through third, through fourth, I'm sorry, was at Central School. Fifth grade was at Mesa School. And by now, there's a huge housing boom going on in Los Alamos. Uh, it's growing leaps and bounds. Lots of workers coming in for the lab, for Zia. Uh, it, if you had a security badge, it was a controlled number that started with a Z as in zebra. And my father's Z badge number was 844. Very low number. And I remember that because when I went to work at the lab, which I'll discuss a little later on, uh, my Z number was Z14127. So Pop had one of the first ones that, that was issued there. Uh, in uh, 1947, we had a new addition to the family, my brother Anthony, and he was born at the old Army Hospital, uh, and it was still uh, medical, excuse me, uh, military personnel. We always used to get a laugh that uh, Mother's OBGYN was a captain by the name of Dr. Love, which we thought that was kind of, kind of neat. But up to then, there's, uh, there's the famous lodge, there's the big house, there's all of these buildings that people write about and talk about, and, and the lodge was a, a fabulous place to go to. Uh, they, they served great meals. Uh, one of the chefs who became a good friend of mother and father's uh, was Gilbert Solis. Uh, he had a place down in El Rancho. And, uh, uh, we would ever so often go over there and he would sneak us little something to eat on the side and so forth. Uh, the lodge had a, a, a little dorm attached to it where the waitresses actually lived there. Uh, and then the, the lodge itself had so many rooms where some of the scientists would, uh, were, were living until housing was available. And housing was really, really tight. It was uh, just phenomenal the way uh, people were able to exist back then. The hospital was located right next to Ashley Pond. And I remember shortly after we moved there, there was the Bowen family. And if I'm not mistaken, it, the family, the son, was probably one of the first accidental deaths in Los Alamos. He was in a canoe out in the pond with some others and he fell over, got tangled up with some weeds or something underneath and he drowned. And I remember being on the side and others when they brought him out of there. Uh, one of his sisters was a, a year or two ahead of me. Another, Marilyn, was Arlene, I'm sorry, Arlene Bowen, was one year behind me. The hospital was kind of unique. It had an old military uh, ambulance with the big red cross painted on the side. And later in time, I don't know where the money came from, but they came up with two brand new green Packards ambulances, these old big old cars, and they were really fancy back then. But uh, medical services was great. You didn't pay for it. Uh, it basically, most of it was free. Uh, one of the physicians who remained there for years afterwards was Dr. William Oakes. Uh, he was there forever. Uh, and as we continued to develop and grow in schooling and so forth, uh, my parents became for lack of a better word, the charter members of the first parish, Catholic parish in Los Alamos, the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And that was quite a deal, uh, being the fact that we had no church of our own, and we improvised among other uh, religious organizations. There were two famous buildings in Los Alamos, Theater Number 1 and Theater Number 2. Number 2 was located down a little further towards DP, and number one was closer to where the community center is now, up around where the post office is, not far from the lodge. And the, we had some fabulous entertainment in the war years. It, it was phenomenal. Uh, there were these touring groups like in basketball. We had the original Harlem Globetrotters. 
I saw Goose Tatum, the Goose Tatum, played basketball against the men's team in Los Alamos. We had the Redheads, a, a woman's team that had all their hair dyed red, and they traveled all over the United States and the world, and they came there. Uh, we got involved also in the wrestling uh, arena rink, uh, and there was this gentleman by the name of Gorgeous George. He dyed his hair blonde, and he had this harem that would come out with him. There was another wrestler I would all, we always remember, by, uh, he, wore, he, he was called the Gray Mask, and he would headbutt all these people, and uh, he must have had an iron plate in his head because a lot of the people that he would hit would actually bleed. And in between rounds, they had us little kids, and they would put gloves on us, they put us in the ring, about eight or ten of us, blindfold us, and then we'd just start, you know, throwing our fist all over, and I could hear my father out <laughs> by ringside. A little to the left, Demons. No, right there now. Let it go. Let the left go. Let the right go. Or <laughs> something. Sometimes it connected, sometimes it didn't. My dad was a huge fight fan, and at that time, the famous Joe Lewis was a world heavyweight champion. Right on the front side of the lodge was a beautiful green lawn. And when Joe Lewis fought Billy Kahn and others, they would set up these speakers, and it was full of the uh, Zia laboratory personnel, lots of military, and they had lots of beer and pop for the kids. We'd take our blankets there and listen to the fights out in front of the, of the big house. Uh, we had a youth center, a very nice one, next to the big house. It was built specifically for us, and uh, but it was mostly the the upperclassmen. Not a a very unique thing that uh, we experienced is that because K through 12 were all under one roof, you got to know the upperclassmen and ladies very very well. Uh, so it was nothing unheard of to know the juniors and the seniors as well as the third graders and the fourth graders because we all crossed each other and so forth. And that came in handy because a, a lot of them kind of took you under their wing and protected you. Uh, I remember one gentleman, Bob Martin, uh, he was an upperclassman and his sister, Dolores Wrightley, she lives in Hamas right now, and we communicate to this day. But Bob uh, sort of took me and adopted me as his little kid, so no one laid a hand on me because they knew that they, had have, they would have Bob to, to deal with. Now, something that a lot of people don't talk about regarding Los Alamos in the early years and, uh, and being Hispanic is that we had our fair share of Archie Bunkers up there. Uh, there was elements of... Uh, blatant discrimination. Uh, I can recall going to birthday parties, not that many, but a few, where my cake and ice cream was served to me outside. Uh, later in years, there were families whose daughters were not allowed to date Mexican-Americans. Uh, but thankfully, there wasn't that much, but it was there. But I think the one that really burnt me the most was uh, no one owned a home back then, of course, as you know. It was all Z around everything. Housing was awarded on the point system, and the point system was based on salary. So the higher your salary, the greater your points. The better the home, the higher the points. So there were families who maybe it was just the wife and husband or maybe one child, and they would get these nice plush homes. And then there was Pop. Uh, we qualified for a Denver Steel which we moved there, oh, I think when I was in about the seventh grade, and it was just a two-bedroom uh, home. They're still standing, and I'm the proud owner of 3886 Ridgeway Drive, a Denver Steel that my mother and father had, of which Dad bought for $1,800 back when <laughs> the home sold to, to uh, the private uh, sector. But in this home, it had two bedrooms. One bedroom uh, was taken by my sisters, Dolores and uh, Lenora, and the other bedroom was my brother and I, Anthony and myself. And my mother and father's bedroom was the living room. And as you walk into Denver Steel, on the right-hand side there was a closet, and in there they kept a rollaway bed. So at night, they would clear the tables and so forth, undo the rollaway bed, and that became mom and pop's bedroom. And 
they did this for years. Uh, by now, there's uh, some additional schools that have opened up, Mesa School, where I went to the fifth grade, Canyon School, with the, and they all still stand. Mesa is now part of the University of New Mexico or something or other. Uh, Canyon School has been converted into maybe a laboratory uh, complex of some sort, but I went to the sixth grade there, and I started, started the seventh in, uh, at, uh, at uh, the new high school. Uh, football and basketball, it was all, they, they did them all. The football field was actually where the airstrip is right now in Los Alamos as you come up on the right-hand side. Uh, Robert E. McKee, uh, who was the primary project director at the time, built that. And uh, there was a huge incinerator located right next to the football field where all the garbage was burnt and collected and burnt right there. Uh, the first coach was uh, Mr. McWilliams, and after he left, and Robert uh, Cox came by and, and took, took, took over after that. Now, when World War II broke out, as I mentioned, and, and things were going, there was a relocation camp in Santa Fe that I remember my father showing to us, where back then uh, President Roosevelt issued some executive order to round up all of the Japanese Americans. Uh, because in fear that they might be uh, working with Japan, who had declared war on the United States. Uh, and I remember passing by these places, and you could see them behind the barbed wire. And uh, that was probably one of the sore spots in American history that we committed, uh, civil rights, whatever. And, and that, that finally got, got clarified. Uh, I talk about the military, they were there for quite some time, and uh, an interesting thing, right on Trinity Drive, there was this huge building they called the Hangar, it was a, it was a humongous building, and the military did all of their maintenance on their vehicles there. Uh, on the side were vehicles that were for use, that they could check out and so forth, but it became a unique playground for us because they did away with the key system because they were constantly losing them or what have you, so they just had a toggle switch. On Sundays, there was very low, little security. The MPs used to basically do it 24-7 there. So we'd sneak in and we would jump in Jeeps and sedans and we, that's the way we taught each other how to drive. A couple of fender benders here and there, but it, it was just, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> there were three major elements that we all used to aspire to. Uh, age 12 to join the Boy Scouts. We had two scouting troops, 20 and 22. Uh, age of 14, believe it or not, that's all you had to be in New Mexico at the time to get a driver's license. And that was basically due to uh, the farming communities and so forth so that the young boys could uh, assist with the machinery, driving trucks and so forth. And 18, which would probably be unheard of nowadays, and it is, it was to sign up for the selective board for the draft. Uh, there was a, a beautiful lady, Lucille Siglock, uh, who was the uh, selective service officer for Los Alamos. And her son, Walter Siglock, a, a dear friend of mine, and we still communicate uh, with each other, and married one of my childhood playmates, uh, Beverly C., uh, she was the lady that we all went to see at 18. And it was a, it was a monumental t thing back then. It was a, an element of pride. Uh, no one was burning draft cards or anything of that nature. We, we all wanted to, to do our fair share. And, and we were anxious to do it. We were honored to do it. Uh, and we also altered more draft selective cards that you've ever seen, trying to make our age look as though we were 21 so we could buy a beer or something of that nature. Now, speaking of that, when we became 14, uh, I started inquiring about where it would be best to take the driver's test. And everybody said, don't take it Los Alamos or Santa Fe. It's a tough test. Someone said, go to Española. So I talked mom and dad to see if I could possibly take my driver's test in Española. So mom and pop said, no problem. So here's mom, and I'm proudly driving her and I down to Española. We arrived at the police station, 
and everybody knew mom and pop. Uh, a lot of the men that worked uh, in Zia Company knew dad. A lot of them worked for dad. Dad was a foreman. Uh, he was a heavy-duty operator in labor. So we walked into the police station. I'll never forget this. Uh, I was nervous. I didn't know what they were going to ask. And I was not the brightest star in the in the universe. I still the English language was was a thing that really really haunted me. Being able to understand, being able to write, uh, not being laughed at with my thick accent and things of that nature. So I remember the question uh, after Mom and I got in there. Everybody want to know how's Dad, how's this, how's that. And then one of the gentlemen says, well, what can I do for him, Miss Chai? He says, well, I, I brought my son down here. He's ready to take his exam to get his driver's license. Oh, so this is all in Spanish. So, because that's what we all felt comfortable with. So he looks at me and he says, uh, do you know how to drive? And I said, yes, sir. Well, good. He spent it. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> that was my driver's test at the age of 14. Now... We made a huge discovery, again, thanks to our upperclassmen and so forth. There was a place in Chimayo, just outside of Española, on the way up to Santa Cruz Lake, on the left-hand side, in fact, uh, that was dubbed or named Mother Hubbard's. And what this was, was that we would all gather our money, and you would drive down the street in Chimayo and take a left at this certain house and you would go through the gate and you would come upon a window and you'd stop the car. A little sliding door window would open up and this little old lady would say, can I help you? And we'd say, yeah, we'd like a six pack of this or that or whatever. And she would produce it and she would say, that'll be such and such, we'd pay for it. No ID requested or nothing, and we'd drive off and come back. Now, between Española and Los Alamos, there was this, it wasn't a treacherous road, but it was called the dips. And the, there was just dips all up and down, right next to the Black Mesa. And we thought it was a lot of fun to gun the car going down, deaccelerate as it went up, and he had come airborne, and we were doing evil can evil things before he was even on the planet. It wasn't very good on the struts or mufflers and what have you, but that was that was a lot of fun. Next to that, by the Rio Grande and the Black Mesa, was a place called the Gravel Pits, where they had a batch plant for all the cement that was needed up in Los Alamos. And the procedure for this was basically to dig these deep holes to get all the aggregate to mix for the concrete and what have you that was needed. And that pit would fill up with water from the Rio, but it was clear water. And also water that they used to clean, clean off the, the aggregate. And th there was some pretty deep uh, holes there, and we'd go there skinny dipping at night, and so forth, it was another way to pass the time. Or another uh, fun thing to do was uh, uh, we would go, drive up to Española, we'd get off at the bridge with some uh, inner tubes that were filled up, we'd take uh, Inside, we'd sit inside the inner tube and ride the Rio Grande all the way down to Ottawa Bridge. And those who weren't in the inner tube would go on down there and they would set up a little campfire. And we'd, by the time we got there, we'd have cold drinks and hot dogs or what have you. And just another way of passing the time. I became an altar boy. Uh, through the procedures of going through all of these various places that I mentioned for mass because we would improvise. We had, it was either mass at theater number one or theater number two or various other places. In addition to this, we had a tremendous amount of uh, mess halls, military mess halls. There was East Cafeteria, West Cafeteria, South Cafeteria, Central Cafeteria. At East Cafeteria, and this is something that uh, Dr. Oppenheimer wanted badly to do. Uh, they built and developed sort of a, a, a supper club uh, element, if you will. It was called a civic club. Uh, they had nice white tablecloths, and you had to have reservations to go there. And they, and they served a, a little better quality meal than the regular metal trays that you would get and go through for 
25 cents a piece or whatever it was. Uh, and that, that went well. Uh, being an altar boy was, uh, was quite, a, quite a deal because when we had uh, mass at theater number two, uh, our priest, and when we were studying catechism, I, got, I made my first Holy Communion in uh, June of 1945, uh, and the nuns and the priests would come up from Santa Fe, and, and they would instruct us on the procedures. And the priest, when we had Mass at Theater Number 2, usually on a Saturday night, there were big bands that came through. I mean, we're talking Glenn Miller, we're talking the biggies back then. And I remember in theater number two, there was this huge globe that rotated on top with the mirrors and lights that would reflect on it. Uh, you had Arnold Wrench on one of your interviews, and he was quite a trumpet player. And he had a band. It was either the Blue Notes, the, uh, something like that. And, and uh, he had a, a beautiful sounding band. He was also a glass blower at the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory, uh, and a very good one. And he did precision glass blowing and so forth. But there were a variety of other bands in the area. Bob Porton played the drums. Uh, Dick Money was another. He was a chemist. He played the drums. But we would arrive early on Sunday because we had to clean up and get ready for mass, and clean up all the old beer bottles and so forth. And occasionally someone who wasn't able to make it home that night, so we kind of help him along somewhere. Uh, but there were really, really, really neat, neat things. And then finally we got our own church, and it's on Canyon Road, and it's still there. And if you were looking from top down, it made a cross. And on the left-hand side belonged to the Catholic Church, so we would have our daily masses there. And we all shared the center part, which was a larger area for Sunday Masses or whatever other uh, religious organizations uh, were having there. And then we finally got our own church on Canyon Road. And then, of course, now where the present one is, the Immaculate Heart of Mary Parish, right next to the high school. Uh, there was a gentleman who will always remember, and he's still around. He's, he's an icon in Los Alamos by the name of Bun Ryan. Bun was a, a famous softball pitcher for Parati's Clowns. And Bun and his wife Jean and their children lived not far from us. They're at the Denver Steels, but they had a, a different type of housing. And on Sundays, uh, Bun would go uh, to the early mass while Jean stayed home with the children. And then Bun would hurry home, and then Jean would go to the 10 o'clock mass, of which I was usually the altar boy for that mass. And I remember this one particular Sunday, uh, it was towards the end of the Mass, and Jean always left just a little before 11 o'clock because she had her shift at the hospital. And I remember this priest, whose name I won't mention, uh, he heard some noise and he just stopped and turned around and he looks at her and he says, excuse me, but where are you going? Mass isn't over. And I looked around and it was poor Jean and she was so embarrassed. And she came back and sat down, and I was just so mad. And I remember right after Mass, I came up to this particular priest, and I took off my cassock. And I told him with a trembling, shaking voice, I said, you were wrong in what you did. And I explained why. And I said, as long as you're here, I'm no longer an altar boy. So I Figured I threw away my chances of becoming the, fix, the first Mexican pope, but uh, nevertheless, <laughs> that ended that. I was concerned about mom and dad, how their reaction would be. I explained it to them. They supported me 100% all the way. There were a couple of clubs. There was the VFW. There was the American Legion. The American Legion was special because at that time they had the first home delivery food system. And it was Jesse and Alice Flores, and they ran El Tapiac. And he had a little green Jeep. And my dear friend Larry Nagy and I worked there. And we would help uh, Ross Garcia, a distant relative, uh, with the preparation of the home deliveries. And we would load them up in this Jeep and had special ovens. And we'd get their address and we'd go to the homes, a lot of the eminent scientists' homes and so forth. And we delivered 
the goodies there. Uh, I remember going in the homes of numerous uh, scientists, and I guess probably one of my most memorable ones was growing up with the Bradbury boys, uh, Dr. Bradbury's uh, family, Jim, John, and David. Jim was uh, one or two years ahead of me, maybe two. John was in my same class, and David was a couple of years behind me. But I remember well on, I think it was like July the 15th of 1945, and John approached me at school, and he said, Demas, I've got a, a special secret I want to tell you, but I, I'd like to invite you. And I said, well, what's this about? And he says, well, tomorrow morning, we're going up to Sawyer's Hill, but you can't tell your parents, and we need to be up there between 4 and 4.30 in the morning. I said, well, what are you doing? What's going on? Well, we're going my mom and some others. I can't tell you any more than that. So I went home, and I got to thinking, now, really, how do you explain to your mother and father, uh, eight-year-old kid or whatever, asking permission to leave the house at 4 o'clock in the morning to go up in the mountains, and you can't tell them why? And I figured, now, it, it was so ridiculous, and I just didn't even want to consider the volcanic reaction that Dad would have. So I let it go. But what it was is that those who went up there, they were instructed or informed, asked, to look south, which is to your right, as you were high in the uh, Pajarito Mountains there, and just keep looking down there. So at about five hours and 29 minutes in the morning, there was this huge ball of fire that appeared. All of them, they could be seen up towards the mountains there in Los Alamos. And it was the detonation of Trinity, the gadget. And John, I saw him later a day or so, and he says, oh, Demas, you should have seen it. It was, it was awesome. And I told that about it. He, he just, yeah. Now, a lot of talk about Oppenheimer, a lot of talk about Groves, and you talk about the odd couple, my goodness. Uh, Dr. Oppenheimer was just a, a majestic person to me. I just uh, adored that man. And I, I got to know him. Uh, General Groves, we would see him, and while Oppie was a tall, lean, those majestic blue eyes, uh, Groves was just the opposite. He looked like a fire hydrant. And uh, at Tech Area 1, right off on Trinity Road, which was the primary area at that time, uh, Dr. Oppenheimer worked there, and I would station myself directly outside the guardhouse, and he would come by, and I would sell him a paper, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And this happened periodically. And soon he got to know me. And he look at me and say, hello, Demas, and Dr. Oppenheimer, and so forth. Well, I told Dad about this, and he said, nah, nah, nah. I think it's, you know, you don't know Dr. Oppenheimer. There's just no way, you know. I mean, this is a famous man, you know. So one day, Mom asked uh, Dad to go to the trading post and pick up some items, which was right next to the PX, post exchange there. And uh, I'm in line right behind Dad. He's getting ready to pay for some things. And I hear a group of people behind me talking. And I heard that voice. And I turned around. And there's Dr. Oppenheimer. And he's chitty-chatting with some people. And he looked at me. And he recognized me. And he said, hello, Demas. And my dad heard this. And then the next thing. Dr. Oppenheimer, I'd like you to meet my father, Trinidad Chavez. And I'll tell you, it was the greatest moment of my life. Walked home and Dad could not believe it. He just couldn't believe it. Uh, life continued, and as I indicated a little earlier, uh, Cindy, I, I, I really wish that more attention or more recognition could have been given to the Zia company while they were there. Uh, certainly, we have eminent, world-renowned scientists from all over, and, and they're the ones who did all the scientific tinkering and so forth, but it could not have been done without the blood, sweat, and tears of, of all of the personnel, men and women, who supported the lab. Zia Company was the landlord, they, they, they were the plumbers, they were the electricians, they took care of the hospitals, they took care of the library. Uh, they built things for our public use. The first swimming pool in Los Alamos was erected not far from P Prime. Uh, it, it was just a, a group of individuals who were outstanding. 
and, and they were always in the front line. Uh, my dad, I remember vividly in the 40s, I remember that the, the gas line, natural gas that came in uh, from uh, up, in, up high around the, band, uh, not Bandelier, but the Hamas, it froze. Now back then, uh, building was a problem because there were no blueprints. If the water w uh, lines that Dad worked on would break, it, I mean, it was a hunt and peck because you couldn't say, okay, it's located right here or they didn't have the instrumentation for this and that. Everything was built on a whim and it was never envisioned that it would be a permanent area. Uh, and. I, I recall Dad was vividly involved at the, that period of time and many others from Zia. Uh, he worked a seven-day week for I don't know how long. Uh, and and, and he, he just gave a lot. Now, something that I'd like to share with you, uh, Cindy, if I may, is upon my father <coughs> was awarded this. And uh, not too many people that I know of, I know a lot of them did, but this is one of the few rare ones that I ever saw, and my pop's uh, name on the bottom. And along with that, the, the book that you recently finished, or, or edited, The Manhattan Project, there is the, the little medal uh, for those who participated in the development of the atomic bomb. And <clears throat> Dad gave this to me, oh gosh, I can't remember how long ago. And just super memorials, super memorials. Uh, but anyway, he and numerous other uh, Z employees uh, just, just gave a lot, a lot. Uh, there was a group of individuals that I remember called the Iron Workers, and there were two particular individuals that I want to share with you. Louis Rojas, who was not only a, an iron worker, but he was the sheriff of Los Alamos County forever. I mean, he would run for his four-year term, and he had a deal with somebody, and, and they would then run and with the agreement that they, as soon as they finished that term, they would out so Louis, Louis could get back in. There was another individual uh, uh, who, uh, who worked there, uh, uh, Manuel, oh my goodness, my, my mind has slipped me, excuse me. Uh, he was a speak. Ben Lujan, excuse me, Ben Lujan from uh, Nambe. Uh, ben was one of the original iron workers and he got into politics, became Speaker of the House, highly recognized politically, and unfortunately Ben just passed away a few months ago. Uh, but a, but a, a superhuman being, a great person. Uh, schooling, as I said, in high school began in seventh grade uh, through the twelfth grade. Uh, a lot of interesting things went on back then for, for kids. Uh, if you wanted to discipline your child, you would take away their red badge of which you had to show on the exiting or entering Los Alamos, and we used to get around by that uh, on that by stuffing people in a trunk and going out there. Uh, we used to frequent the, the drive-in theaters down in Española, the, the Starlighter, and there was one down by Tezuki. Uh One of the greatest compliments, I think, that, ever, that I was ever given in high school was we had the famous Sadie Hawkins dance, and this is where the girls would ask the boys to the special dance. So it's on Wednesday, and most of my friends have been already asked, and I had not. And then the unthinkable took place. A senior lady, a beautiful lady, by the name of Mary Lyons, asked me to the Sadie Hawkins dance. So here is a senior asking a freshman. It was unheard of. And I was just absolutely thrilled. And word spread, and wow, was that something. Uh, Mary came by and picked me up in the family Oldsmobile 98, and we went, went to the dance, had a great time, got married like everybody else. It was, it was just, just a wonderful time. And there was never any real uh, delinquency issues, drug issues, uh, anything of that nature. We, we all really had a tremendous amount of respect, and I think that came from our parents. 
because of the conditions of Los Alamos, the regimentation, thou shall not, period. Uh, my father never spoke, not that he was involved in any real scientific intricacies of the atomic bomb, but he never spoke about what he did or where he did or why he did. Uh, and, and certainly uh, students of eminent scientists, we never talked about it. We talked about other things, you know, let's go fishing or let's do this, let's do that. Uh, so it, it was just uh, grandiose times, uh, like I, I mean, it's something that you'll carry here and here for the rest of your life. In 1955, June 2nd to be specific, uh, the commencement, one of the commencement speakers that we had, and he came not as a scientist, but as our county representative, was Harold Agnew. And uh, he spoke eloquently, and, and Harold, just, I just love that man. Uh, later in time, after I graduated, I didn't have the funds to go to school, my parents didn't. So I laid out a year, and got myself a job, and I landed working at the lab as a truck driver, uh, as a, yeah, truck driver helper. And uh, I used to deliver a variety of things all over the lab. And one place I used to go to was down in the canyon where the ice skating rink is located at the other end. And Harold had a group down there where he was a group leader. And I got to know him a little better then. I then finally found the funds to go to school. And thank goodness for the Los Alamos National Laboratory, they had a summer student program because without that I could not have had, uh, achieved uh, a college education with the money that I was able to uh, save from that. Uh, I went to the service, uh, later in time, much later in time, uh, Harold became the director after Norris Bradbury departed and he had an opening for the employee relations manager, a brand new position that he had come up with and I interviewed and he selected me to come and work at the lab as the employee relations manager. The uniqueness of Harold that I remember <clears throat> vividly was his personality, uh, his way of interacting with everybody. Marge Duby, who was his secretary, uh, whenever Harold needed me, I had to be there quickly. And Marge would only say a couple of words. Demas, he wants you now. And click, and I would take off running up to, to his office on the fourth floor at uh, SMT843. And I remember I came up there one day that Marge had just called me, and she says, he's busy right now. Now, this is typical Agno. So I sat, and 15, 20 minutes go by, and I could hear a little laughter in the office. And the door opens, and Simon the janitor of the fourth floor comes out holding his broom and Harold had just run into him in the men's room and asked him to come in and they just, I mean that was Harold. We just started chitty chatting about this, about that. Uh, his wife Beverly was a, a lovely lady. Uh, they used to host all the staff member uh, get togethers and so forth. Uh, he would greet uh, uh, all the newcomers there. Uh, Harold used to share with us uh, he said the only reason he ever got a job at Los Alamos was because Oppenheimer had the hots for his wife, Beverly. And Harold was a handsome man. And he still is. I still stay in touch with him. We interact periodically on email or by telephone. Uh, there were other scientific families that I got to know uh, throughout the years. Uh, some that I've stayed in contact, others that I have not. Uh, some sad one, sad stories like uh, John Woodward, who was in my class, uh, just a, a brilliant, brilliant student, got a full scholarship to Harvard, and uh, I remember right after he finished his freshman year, he came home for the holidays, and he and his father had this uh, interaction or this argument, for lack of a better word, that one could honestly overcome carbon monoxide, and John was hell-bent on proving that. And one day he took the family car up to Barranca Mesa before they built the homes up there. And they took an extension hose from his mother's vacuum cleaner, hooked it up to the exhaust, curled it around the back window, rolled it up, and then stuffed the opening with, uh, with uh, cloths. 
and began began writing. I now do this, I, and that was it. He died. In 47, 46, something like that, uh, speaking of Barranca Mesa, they used to test uh, bazookas, ordnance, and duds they would just leave lying there. There was the Wheeler boys that they found an old undetonated bazooka shell. They brought it home. And they would keep it in, in the room there. And I remember we'd toss that around, we'd bang on it, and then we developed a little game where you would lean out, and they li lived in one of the sunts, would lean over the upper railing, and at the bottom we would open the garbage can and drop it, and if you could go inside, you got a point. And the first one, the 10, would win. Well, unfortunately, what happened uh, sometime shortly thereafter, uh, there was a group of kids that were mimicking what we were doing. Leroy Chavez, no relation, and uh, Don Markey. Uh, he was only five years old at the time. And they dropped it and it detonated. And Leroy had his legs severely broken. He had had several operations. And thank goodness for, for Don, uh, he just had some cuts and scratches and so forth. But uh, those were kind of the hardships that we faced from time to time and crazy things that took place. Uh, but all in all, uh, as I said, I, I, I think of Los Alamos constantly. I get back there two or three times a year. My wife and I are just now presently thinking of making a trip back there uh, in April. I still have some friends there that I communicate with and stay in touch with. Uh, I, uh, I have memories of the rain, the rolling thunder, that lovely odor that would uh, permeate the area with the pine and, and, and just, just everything. It was just something that would just put you in a, in a total different world. Uh, I feel fortunate to have been brought up in Los Alamos, and I applaud you, Cindy, and this organization, all the people that you've been able to bring here <clears throat> to preserve the, uh, the history of Los Alamos. Uh, and I'm honored to, uh, to come before you to present a different slant, <laughs> that of a young, young kid. Uh, and it's a story. We all have a story to tell. And it's one that I, that I really enjoy sharing. Uh, and of course, I, I truly, truly enjoy listening to all the ones that you have had. Jay Wexler, another dear friend of mine, uh, listening to him and talk about the old days, uh, it, it, it's, it's really, really good. I applaud the National Science Foundation. Uh, I worked for them at one time. Uh, P.W. Keaton, a top physicist at Los Alamos, was selected by President Reagan as his uh, scientific advisor, and at that time the National Science Foundation had an opening, and uh, P.W. whispered in President Reagan's ear, Ed Knapp is the guy for you to head up NSF, and, and Ed was selected, and he worked out a deal with Don Kerr, who was the director at the time, who I was working with as the employee relations manager after Harold left, and I got a change of duty station from Los Alamos to come to NSF to work for Ed Knapp. And uh, while I was there, uh, I got an offer from the Department of State to work at Diplomatic Security, so I got my leave extended a couple of years. And then, as the old saying goes, I was made an offer I couldn't resist, so I resigned from the lab and went to work full time and wound up my federal career with the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, but during that period of time, it was, uh, it was just uh, wonderful. Uh, but I've never and will never forget my dear Los Alamos.